Hi, let's talk about Darwin and what actually influenced him to come up with his own theory of how evolution actually works. Back in the 1800s, it was believed that the Earth was only 4,000 years old. Some of that belief came from um, old religious writings, and um, that's what a lot of the population believed. And it was actually shunned upon, like, if somebody believed something differently, because then you're going against the religion. In the 1800s also, Hutton and Lyell, they were geologists. They studied the earth and how it changed and formed. And they looked at mountains and they said to each other, you know, hey, these mountains could not have formed in just 4,000 years. They have to be over several millions of years old. Also in the 1800s, the general public, they thought, you know, life has always been the way it is. It will never change. It's just like a tiger has always looked like a tiger. It has never changed its attributes at all. Its ancestors all looked the same and everything in the future will all look the same. Tigers will always be the same. All right. Now, Lamarck, he is the first one that actually came up with this theory that things changed. And he looked at giraffes and he was like, hmm, you know, I think giraffes started with short necks. And then as the trees grew taller, those giraffes stretched their necks to reach the leaves. And then as they had babies, their babies just had longer necks because they had to reach up for taller trees. And their parents passed that attribute down to them. That's called an acquired trait. So now as we get a little farther along, evolution, what we've we found evolution to be, it's, it means descent with modification. So that means having offspring and there are differences within those offspring compared to what the parents have. A theory is a well-supported testable explanation that allows for predictions. So we learned about theories last week and scientific theories are different than just the everyday theories. Like people say, I have a theory that my dog will eat lots of food today. That's not a scientific theory. A scientific theory, it's really well supported. You can test it out and it just keeps coming out the same way every time with the same results. Uh, therefore, the theory of evolution. So theory, well-testable explanation, allows for predictions, and evolution means that it's uh, descent with modification. So this is not your family tree. We've got great-grandfather, grandfather, father, you. Okay. That's not the way a family tree actually works. It's not just a single line. The family tree works more like the bottom picture. You've got Lots of people, families, cousins, lots of different things going on here. Lots of different attributes for each of these people. And evolution is not like the top there, like a fish turns into a salamander, a salamander turns into a cat, and then there's you. Nope, it doesn't work that way. We start out with what happens is there is a common ancestor here that had fish come out of it. And this is a long, like might be a million years long all the way down here, or a billion years. And then here there's this other shoot off with another other attributes playing in here. And then we get this other common ancestor here like a four-legged vertebrate, and it shoots off and makes amphibians, but also it shoots off and makes something over here, and that's a common ancestor for mammals. And then we've got, it looks like a cat, 
and then it shoots off down here and there's going to be you know more common ancestors we're going to talk more about this as time goes by so don't don't stress out on this these two slides okay artificial selection that means that nature provides variety in these species um, and humans can select for variations that they found useful so Darwin really enjoyed pigeons and how they came out in all these varying styles and he made it a part of what he liked to do on the side it was his hobby he would breed pigeons and then as they would show certain traits like maybe somebody was one of the pigeons was really fluffy looking like this and he would breed many of these fluffy ones together and it would end up being a whole different looking bird than what this pigeon looks like so the person that is in charge of seeing which ones mate together they control that so that they have these varieties that they like here's a great example dairy farmers my grandpa was actually a dairy farmer and back in the 60s and 70s he had cows that would produce maybe let's say four gallons of milk a day um, now what do you think he would do if he had some of the some of the cows would produce 10 gallons of milk a day and others would only produce four which ones would he want to have babies to have more milk producing cows bread yep he would pick the one that actually produced more milk in the first place and he'd mate that one with um, a bull and they would get more cows that would produce more milk cows are producing more milk today than they ever did back in the 60s and 70s because of this the farmers and the business owners that own these cows are only breeding the ones that actually produce a lot of milk that is artificial selection we are artificially selecting traits that we want to continue in the line now natural selection it's done naturally so it's really just survival of the fittest so here we have a penguin and it is in this environment that's super super cold windy um, they have to go down into the cold water to get fish now which ones do you think are going to survive the best probably the ones that have a lot of fat on them and that are good fishing fish, fishermen so those naturally are going to be the penguins that actually survive and that goes with fitness fitness is how well an organism can survive and reproduce in its environment so this little baby he's very fit for this environment he's got lots of fluff on him and he's got some fat on him so he can actually survive so he is probably more fit than another baby that is maybe skinnier and doesn't have as much fluff on him 